Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. I don't know about you, but more and more these days, time just feels like an unstoppable train that just keeps going faster and faster. It seems like only yesterday that we were celebrating the start of 2022, and now it's completely in the rearview mirror. Regardless, we hope that this holiday season you found some time to spend with friends and family and all of the other people most important to you in your lives. I know Luke and I certainly did, which is why this week, instead of our usual Crimes of the Week video, we've got something a little different for you that we prepared ahead of time before we both went off for our respective holidays. In particular, we figured what better way to send 2022 off once and for all than by taking a look back at all of the weirdest and most what the f crime stories we covered this year on our Crimes of the Week series. Just a heads up, because this is a compilation style video, keep in mind that these segments have not been edited since they first appeared in their respective lists, so references to specific days of the week, as well as other small details may no longer apply. Also, if you've watched our dumbest criminals lists throughout the year, we've tried our best to select different stories that weren't included in those videos to make things a little more fresh. At the time of this recording, it's still not quite the end of 2022, and we're not 100% sure if this will be released before or after the calendar officially turns over. But in either case, we wanted to wish you all a Happy New Year. Honestly, you all helped to make 2022 such a fantastic year, and we appreciate every single one of you. Just know that in 2023, we've got some exciting ideas we can't wait to try out, and we plan to push ourselves to keep bringing you more and better videos. With that out of the way, let's get into it. Representatives from Pennsylvania's Newberry Township Police Department say that a 19-year-old woman has been arrested this week after a bizarre DUI stop that involved a live deer. According to reports, the incident began sometime around midnight on January 6th when officers pulled over the 19-year-old suspect somewhere in York County, believing that she might be under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Things quickly took a strange turn, however, when upon getting out to question the driver, police noticed what appeared to be a live deer in her car, which was clearly visible through the window of the vehicle's hatchback trunk. When the officers asked the 19-year-old and her 21-year-old male passenger about the animal, they claimed that they had accidentally hit it while driving. After that, they had placed the deer in the trunk, initially thinking it was dead. They said that they later realized the deer was alive, but for some reason, kept on driving. After listening to the story, police officers had the 21-year-old man go into the trunk of the car and release the deer back into the wild. It's unclear if the animal had suffered any injuries, but it apparently was able to run away. The 19-year-old was subsequently arrested on suspicion of driving under the influence. However, her name has not been released at this time. Authorities in New Orleans, Louisiana, say that a would-be mugger recently got more than he bargained for after he assaulted the mother of a teenage powerlifter who proceeded to chase him down and tackle him. According to reports, on December 28th, 18-year-old Messina Tupea was simply enjoying her vacation with her parents, when out of nowhere, a man sprinted towards her 47-year-old mother Louisa as the family walked down Magazine Street. Before any of them could react, the man had punched Louisa in the jaw, dislocating it, and tried to steal her purse. Though the attacker soon gave up on his attempt to steal the purse and tried to flee the scene, Messina decided she couldn't let him escape and sprung into action. The teenager managed to catch up to the suspect when he was tripped by a bystander. However, the first time she tried to grab him, he punched her in the face and continued to run away. Undeterred, Messina began pursuing the attacker once again, soon catching up to him in an area where her father was chasing him around a car. After dodging another one of the attacker's punches, she grabbed onto the back of his shirt then tackled him to the ground. The attacker tried desperately to escape, but it was no use. What the attacker didn't know about Messina is that despite being just 5 feet 5 inches tall, she is extremely strong. A lifelong athlete and avid powerlifter, Messina still holds a record in the sport from when she was 15, 
when she deadlifted nearly 320 pounds. Messina was able to keep her mother's attacker pinned until police could arrive, at which point he was arrested. The man was subsequently identified as 36-year-old Augustus Taylor, who was now facing one charge for purse snatching and two others for simple battery. According to reports, Taylor has pleaded guilty to battery charges in New Orleans at least four times since 2010. Despite the unfortunate incident, Messina said that she and her family still enjoyed their trip. In interviews with local media, she said, quote, My parents told me that stuff happens, but you can't let stuff like that affect how you perceive places. Although it sucks it happened to us, we're glad someone like that is off the street. Authorities in Bonham County, South Dakota, say that a 46-year-old elementary school teacher was arrested earlier this month after he allegedly baked a pan of marijuana brownies that his elderly mother unwittingly shared with a number of senior citizens. According to reports, police were alerted to the situation around 8 p.m. on January 4th when they began to receive 911 calls about possible poisoning cases involving several senior citizens. When police began to interview the victims, they suspected that they were under the influence of marijuana. They also learned that all of the seniors had ingested brownies earlier that evening while attending a card game at a local community center in the town of Tabor. The next morning, officers interviewed the woman who had brought the brownies, who told them that they had been baked by her son, 46-year-old Michael Caranda, a teacher at Tabor Elementary School. During an interview at the school, Caranda admitted that he had recently traveled to Colorado, where he had purchased a pound of marijuana-infused butter. Upon returning home, he had used half of the butter to bake the brownies, which he had left out. Though Caranda claimed that he had no idea that his mother had taken the brownies to her card game, he was arrested and charged with possession of a controlled substance. Reports allege that if convicted, he could face up to five years in prison and a $10,000 fine. The rest of his marijuana butter was also seized by police. Authorities in the city of Monroe, Louisiana, say that the suspect behind a lengthy vehicle chase offered a fairly novel reason for why he didn't pull over when an officer tried to perform a traffic stop this week. He claimed that he wanted to finish his hamburger first. According to reports, the situation began just after 11 p.m. on January 19th, when an officer from the Monroe Police Department spotted a 2006 Chevy Impala that was driving with its high beams on, making it hard for him to see the road and potentially blinding other drivers in oncoming traffic. However, when the officer turned on his lights and siren to pull the driver over and tell him to turn his lights down, the man did not stop and instead began to lead the officer on a chase. According to the officer, the pursuit lasted for some time, during which the driver blew through at least six stop signs without stopping and drove 60 miles per hour in a 25 zone. The chase allegedly ended when the driver pulled up in front of his home around midnight and stepped out of his vehicle holding a hamburger. The driver was later identified as 37-year-old Alan Seabury. After being arrested and read his rights, Seabury reportedly tried a number of excuses for why he hadn't stopped earlier, including that his brakes weren't functioning properly and that he couldn't stop. However, the most ridiculous one by far was that he had just purchased the hamburger he was eating and he wanted to finish it before pulling over. It appears that the actual reason Seabury didn't stop was far more mundane, however. His vehicle was allegedly uninsured and he was driving without a license. Seabury was booked into the local county jail on a felony aggravated flight charge. He was also charged with three misdemeanors, including driving without a license and driving an uninsured vehicle. Unfortunately, there's no additional information on the burger Seabury was apparently willing to go to jail for. While it's more the aftermath of the crime than the crime itself that's noteworthy in this case, we decided to include this next story on today's list since we thought most of you would get a kick out of it like we did. An officer from South Dakota's Sioux Falls Police Department is being lauded for going above the call of duty this week after he arrested a DoorDash driver during a food delivery and decided to complete the delivery himself. According to reports, the incident took place on the afternoon of January 25th 
when Officer Sam Burr pulled over a DoorDash driver for an undisclosed traffic violation, only to discover that they had a warrant out for their arrest. After taking the driver into custody, Burr evidently decided that it wasn't fair to the DoorDash customer to miss out on their Arby's order just because of the driver's legal troubles, and he proceeded to take the food the rest of the way to its final destination. The decision resulted in an amusing interaction between Burr and the woman who had ordered the food, who was surprised and delighted to find him standing at her door with her order. The whole thing was captured on the woman's ring doorbell camera, where Burr could be heard saying, I know I'm not who you were expecting, but your driver got arrested for some things he didn't take care of, so I figured I'd complete the DoorDash for you. At the time of this recording, no information has been reported on what the warrant was for that led to the driver's arrest. Authorities in Santa Fe County, New Mexico, say that a couple of local homeowners were recently taken on quite the wild emotional ride when they arrived home to find an armed burglar in their house, only to have him apologize and give them money. According to reports, the incident took place sometime during the last weekend of January, when the couple came back to their residence on the outskirts of Santa Fe after being away for at least a day. When they got there, they were surprised to find an unknown man inside, who was armed with a rifle and who had broken in by shattering one of their windows. However, instead of threatening the homeowners or trying to flee, the man immediately apologized to them, saying that he was embarrassed about what he had done. He went on to claim that he was running from someone and that his family had been killed in East Texas, and that he needed a place to stay after his car broke down outside of Santa Fe. During his time in the house, the unknown man had reportedly slept, bathed, and helped himself to some food and beer. After apologizing for what he had done, he gave the homeowners $200 to fix the window, as well as for the $15 to $20 worth of food and beer he had consumed before heading out on his way. By the time police arrived at the scene, the unknown man was nowhere to be found. Authorities have described him only as a man who appeared to be in his late 20s and who was roughly six feet tall. At the current time, the man's identity remains a mystery. Representatives from the Chicago Police Department say that they are searching for multiple unknown suspects this week after they stole a backhoe from a construction site and used it to break into an ATM. According to reports, the incident began either late on February the 10th or early on the 11th when the thieves stole the backhoe from a construction site in Calumet Heights on the city's south side. The suspects then drove the piece of heavy machinery more than 20 miles north to a strip mall on West Morse Avenue in Rogers Park. Once inside the plaza, the unknown suspects drove the backhoe up to a Chase Bank ATM before ramming it repeatedly and breaking into it with the vehicle's jackhammer attachment. When the ATM was completely broken open and destroyed, the thieves fled, leaving the backhoe behind. While police say that the suspects did successfully break into the part of the ATM where the money is kept, it's unclear if they actually took any of the cash inside. At the current time, investigators say that they are searching for the culprits. However, no arrests have yet been made. According to reports, the bizarre incident has shocked and baffled local residents, some of whom were quoted saying that they have never seen anything like this in their lives. Others are allegedly questioning how no one could have seen or heard anything while the crime was being carried out. At the time of this recording, the incident is still under investigation. This week, representatives from the Georgia Office of the Inspector General announced several charges against a former state official after she was accused of faking multiple pregnancies as part of a scheme to fraudulently obtain paid leave. According to reports, at the time the crimes took place, the suspect, 43-year-old Robin Folsom, was working as the Director of External Affairs for the Georgia Vocational Rehabilitation Agency. A press release from this week states that she was in charge of supervising the agency's marketing and media communications. In October of 2020, Folsom reportedly informed the Human Resources Division of the GVRA that she was pregnant and in May of the following year announced that she had given birth. This announcement was accompanied by an email from a man claiming to be the father of Folsom's child, who said that the 43-year-old had been advised by her doctor that she required several weeks of bed rest following the delivery. 
The GVRA then allowed seven weeks of paid leave, which it claims it would not have otherwise approved. However, when Folsom claimed to be pregnant again less than three months after returning from her leave, several people started to become suspicious. This was actually the third time she had apparently claimed to be pregnant, with her first child allegedly being born less than three months before she announced the October 2020 pregnancy. As a side note, it's unclear if she obtained paid leave during all of the fake pregnancies, or whether it was just for the second one. When the Office of the Inspector General began an investigation, more red flags emerged. Several of the people that work with Folsom claimed that when they had been shown photos of her new baby, the pictures were inconsistent, and the child appeared to have varying skin tones. Another co-worker came forward with an even bigger revelation, claiming they believed that Folsom had been wearing a fake pregnancy stomach after witnessing a portion of her stomach appear to, quote, come away from her body in March of 2021. When investigators did some more digging, they were unable to find any birth certificates listing Folsom as a mother, and a review of her medical and insurance records allegedly showed nothing indicating she had ever delivered a child. When the 43-year-old was confronted with this information in October of 2021, she reportedly resigned from her position at the GVRA. According to investigators, the children and the baby bump weren't the only things that Folsom fabricated. When they looked into the email reportedly sent by the father of Folsom's child in May of 2021, they allegedly found out that this man also didn't exist. On February 10th, Folsom was indicted by a Fulton County grand jury on four felony charges, three counts of false statements, and one count of identity fraud. Authorities in Miami-Dade County, Florida, say that they have arrested a 33-year-old woman this week after she allegedly hired a hitman to kill a longtime enemy, a crime which she reportedly paid for with money from a pandemic relief loan. According to reports, 24-year-old TSA officer Lashante Jones was gunned down in front of her three-year-old daughter on May 3rd of last year, and she was just steps from her home in the Miami suburb of Homestead. Though surveillance camera footage led police to the alleged gunman, 29-year-old Javon Carter, detectives quickly learned that the case was more complicated. An investigation reportedly revealed that Carter had been paid to carry out the crime by a 33-year-old woman named Jasmine Martinez. The two were allegedly introduced to one another by a mutual acquaintance named Romeo Robinson, who authorities say helped plan the murder from jail. Sources allege that Martinez and Lashante Jones were longtime enemies. Their feud reportedly began in 2016, when Martinez attacked Jones because she was dating her ex-boyfriend. Though a case related to that incident was dropped, Martinez allegedly never got over the dispute about the ex-boyfriend, and in 2018, she was arrested again for punching Jones in the face. Things escalated further when, in February of 2020, Martinez's new boyfriend allegedly attacked and robbed Jones in the parking lot of a courthouse after they had just come out of a hearing related to the 2018 assault case. The craziness didn't end there, though. In March of 2021, just two months before she was murdered, Jones told police that she was being harassed by Martinez and her new boyfriend once again. This time, they were allegedly offering her money not to testify against the boyfriend for the parking lot assault and robbery, and wanted her to tell police that he wasn't armed at the time. According to reports, Martinez was able to get the $10,000 she paid to Carter to carry out the hit on Jones by securing a $15,000 paycheck protection program loan, which he claimed was for her one-woman beauty salon business. It's unclear if the business ever existed at all. Martinez was arrested this week and has now been charged with first-degree murder, attempted murder, and conspiracy to commit murder. Javon Carter and Romeo Robinson were already in prison at the time of Martinez's arrest on a number of related and unrelated charges. Though Martinez has claimed repeatedly that she had nothing to do with Jones's murder, investigators say they have a number of pieces of evidence connecting her to the crime. These include a video that Carter posted to social media allegedly showing off the money he had been paid to commit the murder, evidence of at least 127 communications that the pair exchanged, as well as months of recorded jailhouse phone calls, during which Martinez reportedly spoke with Robinson and planned the crime. At the time of this recording, Martinez remains in police custody.
Representatives from the Massachusetts State Police say that they have arrested and charged a 24-year-old man this week after he was allegedly caught trying to get into a tiger enclosure at a Boston Zoo. The incident began at approximately 8.45 a.m. on February 21st when staff at Boston's Franklin Park Zoo noticed a man in a non-public area behind the Tiger Tales exhibit. The exhibit is home to Anala, a Bengal tiger mix. When the man realized that he had been spotted by staff members, he quickly climbed over a nearby gate and attempted to escape. However, he was found and taken into custody by the zoo's security staff roughly 15 minutes later. The man was subsequently identified as 24-year-old Matthew Abraham a Worcester State University student majoring in biology. Following Abraham's arrest, he reportedly made a number of bizarre statements to police, the first of which was that he had committed the crime because he was, quote, very interested in tigers. He also claimed that he didn't know that he had to pay admission to the zoo because it was winter and thought that he was simply allowed to view the exhibit. According to zoo officials, this could not possibly be true. While Abraham did not make it into the actual enclosure where the tiger is kept, they say that he still would have had to climb multiple fences and ignore several signs telling him that he was trespassing to get where he was spotted. In subsequent interviews with the media, Abraham reportedly claimed that he didn't mean to harm anyone, including himself or the tiger, going on to say that he just wanted to see how a tiger would react to a human being. He also said that he wanted to get close enough to see into the tiger's eyes, saying, quote, they say it's something called the eye of the tiger. They say the eye of the tiger is the most dangerous thing you'll ever see in your whole life. They say that the soul is visible through the eye. What this means is anyone's guess, although the stunt reportedly earned Abraham charges of trespassing and disorderly conduct. If you're a regular viewer of our Crimes of the Week series, you'll probably know that Abraham is just the latest in a growing number of people who have gotten into trouble for trying to illegally get into animal enclosures at zoos across the United States. Maybe he can get together in the future and compare notes with the El Paso Zoo monkey woman or the notorious Bronx Zoo cat lady. Representatives from Virginia's Henry County Sheriff's Office are extending their thanks to an unlikely helper this week, who they say recently aided in the arrest of a fleeing suspect. That helper was a local goat named Gracie. According to reports, the incident took place on February 13th when two deputies in Henry County were out investigating a domestic assault case in the community of Fielddale. It began when they told a male suspect that he was under arrest, prompting the man to try to escape on foot. When the suspect jumped over a fence and started running through a field, the deputies began to chase him. However, it wasn't long before one of them noticed that they had a bit of unexpected backup. A goat named Gracie had also joined in on the pursuit and was now running alongside the deputies towards the suspect. To the deputies' further surprise, when they reached the next line of fencing in the field, the goat continued to participate in the chase, eventually running in front of them and following the suspect into a wooded area. As one of them stayed put, the other went around to the other side of the woods to try and flush the suspect out. He eventually succeeded, again with the help of Gracie the goat. After that, the suspect was arrested. Following the bizarre chase, Gracie was safely returned to her owner, though police were quick to make a Facebook post thanking her for her help. The post amusingly noted, quote, sometimes help comes in all shapes and sizes. At the time of this recording, the name of the suspect in the case has not been released. Authorities in Denver, Colorado say that they're searching for the suspect or suspects behind a bizarre and macabre theft case this week after a box of human heads was stolen out of the back of a freight truck. According to reports, the crime took place sometime between 2.30 p.m. on March 2nd and 9.30 a.m. on March 3rd, when the freight truck was parked in Denver's Central Park neighborhood. The box of human heads was reportedly being transported for medical research purposes and was labeled, quote, exempt human specimen. It was also labeled with the name of the company that had sent the remains, Science Care, a program for donating bodies to help improve scientific research and education. A dolly belonging to the freight company was likewise found to be missing when the theft was discovered. At the time of this recording, authorities say that no arrests have been made and it remains unclear if there are any suspects. Police say it's quite possible that the thieves didn't even know what they were taking when they committed the theft.
Authorities in Orange County, California, say that they have arrested a 38-year-old man this week after he allegedly stole a 60-foot yacht and led police on a short and destructive chase. According to reports, the incident began at around 10 a.m. on March 10th when residents in Newport Beach began to hear loud noises coming from the harbor. To their surprise, when they looked out to see what was going on, they witnessed an unknown man aboard a 60-foot yacht who was crashing into the boats docked there. As the suspect tried to maneuver the yacht, he repeatedly struck the dock and other vessels there several times, at one point destroying the mast of a sailboat. A woman inside the sailboat could reportedly be heard screaming. Though police were quick to arrive at the scene and try to stop the suspect in their own boat, he was able to push past, continuing his reckless joyride. The suspect was finally forced to stop a few minutes later when he collided with a seawall near Lido Bridge, however, not before he crashed into at least one other boat, causing significant damage. Once the yacht was stuck, police were able to board it and place the suspect under arrest. He was subsequently identified as 38-year-old Joel Seam from San Diego. According to reports, police were already looking for Seam at the time he stole the yacht. They had initially been called to the area after receiving reports about vandalized vehicles nearby. The yacht was an easy target for Seam to steal because it had been docked for maintenance, meaning the keys were inside when he got on board. At the time of this recording, Siam has been charged with grand theft of a boat and possession of a stolen boat and remains in custody on $3 million bail. The conditions of those aboard the boats that Siam struck is not clear, The reports allege that at least one person was injured. Representatives from Florida's Hernando County Sheriff's Office say that they have arrested and charged a local man this week after he allegedly called 911 to ask that his meth be tested for authenticity. According to reports, the incident began at around 7 p.m. on March 10th, when officers were alerted to a 911 call from a residence in the community of Spring Hill. Upon arrival, they were greeted by a man named Thomas Eugene Colucci, who admitted to being the one who had placed the call. Colucci explained to the officers that he had contacted them after recently purchasing two baggies of methamphetamine from a man he had met at a local bar, saying that he had used a bit of it but believed that it was fake. He assured the officers that he was an experienced drug user who had used meth many times before and that he knew what it should feel like. He then allegedly proceeded to pull out the two baggies in question, saying that he believed they were bath salts and that he didn't want anyone else to purchase the, quote, fake meth. He also said that he wanted the police to get the guy who sold him the drugs in trouble. However, he was unable to provide a name or any contact information. When the officers tested the white crystalline substance in the two bags, they had good and bad news for Colucci. The good news was that he hadn't been ripped off, as both bags were found to contain meth. The bad news was that he was now under arrest for possession of illegal drugs. Following Colucci's arrest, he was taken to the Hernando County Detention Center, where he was charged with possession of methamphetamine, as well as two counts of possession of drug paraphernalia. The next day, the Hernando County Sheriff's Office released a post on Facebook detailing the incident, jokingly ending it by saying, quote, If you or someone you know have doubts about the authenticity of any illegal narcotics you have on hand or have obtained from another person, the Hernando County Sheriff's Office is pleased to provide this service free of charge. Authorities in Wisconsin say that a 61-year-old former dentist has been convicted of health care fraud and other charges this week after he was found guilty of running a scheme where he intentionally damaged the teeth of his patients so that he could charge them for fixing the damage he created. According to reports, in 2015, Scott Charmoli began to aggressively sell his patients on crown procedures, a procedure where a tooth-shaped cap is placed on a damaged tooth. However, most, if not all of these patients allegedly did not need this kind of work done. The scheme worked like this. First, Charmoli would convince a patient that they needed crowns. Once they agreed, he would go in and pretend to do the procedure, but would instead break their teeth with a drill. He would then take x-rays, which he would send to insurance companies before fixing the teeth, submitting them under the guise that this was the pre-operation state of the patient's teeth. According to reports, between 2015 and 2019, Charmoli billed over $4.2 million for crown procedures, 
installing more crowns than 95% of other dentists in the state. To give you an idea of how much this was, sources allege that during this time, most Wisconsin dentists installed fewer than six crowns per 100 patients. Charmoli's rate was more than 32 per 100 patients. The crooked dentist was finally caught in 2020, one year after he sold his dental practice. The scheme was uncovered when the new owners of the practice began to look through Charmoli's old paperwork and found that the crown procedures were extremely out of the ordinary. At the end of Charmoli's four-day trial this week, he was found guilty of five counts of healthcare fraud and two counts of making false statements for lying to his patients. He has yet to be sentenced, but is apparently facing up to 60 years in prison. At the time of this recording, nearly 100 former patients of Charmoli's are also suing him for medical malpractice. However, those cases won't start until the conclusion of his criminal case. Charmoli's license to practice dentistry was suspended in February of last year. He first obtained his license in 1986. While no one was technically arrested or charged in connection with this next story, we decided to include it on this week's list since we knew that most of you would get a kick out of it. And, as you'll see, because some people apparently still require clarification about when it's acceptable to call 911. Authorities in the city of Euclid, Ohio, allegedly had to admonish a 62-year-old woman this week after she apparently called 911 to report that she had been shorted on an order of chicken tenders at a local KFC. According to reports, the incident began on the evening of March 22nd, when 62-year-old Lisa Castro dialed 911 and asked for an officer to be dispatched to her location. She claimed that she had just been through the drive through of a KFC restaurant and that she'd only been given four out of the eight chicken tenders she had ordered. She further stated that when she had spoken to the manager of the restaurant, they had refused to give her the chicken that was supposedly missing from her order. Castro told emergency dispatchers that she would be waiting in the parking lot of the KFC in a Dodge SUV until police arrived. Though an officer was sent to Castro's location, much to her chagrin, it was not to force the manager of the KFC to hand over her allegedly missing tenders. Instead, the officer explained that their duties to protect and serve the community did not extend to settling fast food drive through disputes, and that the situation was not a police matter. No charges were filed in connection with the incident, though police apparently released a statement afterwards reminding people that the 911 system is for emergencies only. Pennsylvania state troopers are mourning the loss of two of their own this week after they were allegedly hit by a drunk driver while trying to assist a pedestrian. According to reports, the incident began at around 1 a.m. on March 21st, when state troopers 29-year-old Brandon Siska and 33-year-old Martin Mack III received a call about a man walking in the southbound lanes of Interstate 95. When they arrived at the scene, they allegedly found 28-year-old Reyes Rivera Oliveras as described allegedly walking on the highway near the Broad Street exit. After pulling over, Siska and Mac both got out of their SUV patrol vehicle and made their way over to Oliveris, who they began to escort back to their vehicle. However, as they returned to the SUV, they were allegedly struck out of nowhere by a vehicle being driven at a high rate of speed. After striking the three men, the vehicle hit one of the highway's barriers and continued moving, before pulling off to the side of the road a short distance away. By the time additional police arrived at the scene, a number of passing motorists had stopped and were trying to revive the two officers in Oliveris. However, sadly, it was no use. All three men were pronounced dead at the scene. The driver of the vehicle that struck the men, identified as 21-year-old Jayanna Tanay Webb, was also arrested at the scene. Not only do investigators now allege that Webb was drunk at the time of the incident, they say that she had been pulled over by the very same officer she killed just minutes before the collision. According to reports, Webb was pulled over by Siska and Mac for speeding, but the officers were forced to abandon the roadside stop early because the call involving Oliveris was more of a priority. After Webb's information was collected, she was apparently let off with a warning, only to allegedly go right back to speeding. While all of this is unbelievable enough on its own, perhaps the most galling piece of information about the case came when a search of Webb's social media activity was conducted. 
It turns out that just a few weeks ago, the 21-year-old allegedly bragged about driving under the influence, tweeting out, quote, If you ask me, I'm the best drunk driver ever. At the time of this recording, Webb is now facing 18 different criminal charges in connection with the tragic incident, including three counts of third-degree murder, three counts of homicide by vehicle while driving under the influence, and two counts of second-degree manslaughter of a law enforcement officer. Police in the city of Bellevue, Florida, say that a 16-year-old boy is dead this week after he was shot by one of his friends while they were taking turns putting on a bulletproof vest and firing a gun at one another. According to reports, just after 7 p.m. on April 3rd, police were called to a residence on the 10,400 block of Southeast 52nd Court. When they arrived at the scene, they found 16-year-old Chris Leroy Broad Jr. suffering from a gunshot wound to the chest. The teenager was rushed to the hospital, though once there, he sadly died as a result of his injuries. When police interviewed two of the friends that had been with Chris at the time, 17-year-old Joshua Vining and Colton Whitler, they allegedly initially lied to officers about what had happened. Whitler reportedly told investigators that his house had been shot up by random attackers. However, a third friend who was also present at the time, 18-year-old Evan Vowell, gave a far different explanation of what had led to Chris's death. He said that Chris and Vining had been playing a bizarre and dangerous game at the time of the incident, where the two were taking turns shooting at each other while wearing a bulletproof vest. The so-called game had started when Vining allegedly produced the gun and vest and asked his friends if they had ever seen anyone get shot while wearing body armor before. According to police, they concluded that Val was the one telling the truth after he handed over undisclosed video evidence that backed up his story. On April 7th, Vining and Whitler were both arrested in connection with their friend's death. Vining was arrested for aggravated manslaughter of a child with a firearm while Whitler was arrested for providing false information to law enforcement. It's said that both teenagers are being charged as adults. The story of one Louisiana man's determination to curb vehicle break-ins generated headlines this week after he rigged up a flashbang inside his truck that went off when an unlucky thief smashed the window of the vehicle. According to reports, the whole thing started recently, when the truck owner in question became frustrated after the windows of his vehicle were shattered by suspected thieves seven times in roughly two months. With the police unable to do much, and the man feeling annoyed and helpless, he decided to take things into his own hands. His solution was to rig up a flashbang inside his truck a kind of non-lethal explosive device that is designed to stun a target by simultaneously deafening them with a loud bang and blinding them with a bright light. Though this technically wouldn't stop the man's windows from being broken, he figured it would at least force the culprit to deal with some sort of consequences. Sure enough, the truck owner got his wish on the night of April 1st, when another would-be thief showed up. The resulting incident was caught on surveillance video. In the video, the masked, unknown man can be seen rolling up in a white vehicle before exiting and heading towards the victim's truck. Hilariously, he appears almost giddy and skips towards the truck before shattering its driver's side window with what appears to be a hammer. The man hoists his body through the shattered opening and is about halfway inside before a bright flicker can be seen from within the truck. This was the flashbang going off. Obviously alarmed, the suspect could be seen almost falling out of the window of the truck in panic before running to his own vehicle to make his escape. Aside from getting the fright of his life, it's likely that the thief also experienced temporary blindness and ringing in his ears as a result of the flashbang. Based on the sources we came across, these effects usually last anywhere from a few seconds to a couple of hours. According to the truck owner, this was precisely his goal. Though the man's name has not been released, in a subsequent interview he said, quote, I don't want this guy to die for what he did, but I don't want him to just be able to smash and grab and run away. He probably didn't get hurt that bad, but it wasn't pleasant, and it might deter him and his friends and tell other people not to do this too, because without something like this, there's no consequences, because they're not going to get arrested. 
All that being said, the man and New Orleans police are both discouraging others from following in his footsteps. The police in particular warned that rigging an explosive device like this was illegal and a bad idea, saying that there could be serious consequences even if no one gets hurt. For his part, the truck owner is now selling his condo to get away from his neighborhood, saying that he doesn't have the money to keep paying for broken windows. Authorities in Flagler County, Florida, say that a 57-year-old man was arrested and charged this week after he pretended to be an undercover DEA agent in order to get a discount at a fast food restaurant. According to reports, the situation took place on April 11th when a man named Jesse Stover went to a Wendy's location in the city of Bunnell. Upon ordering his food, he requested the customary 50% discount for police officers and was asked by the location's manager to see some credentials. Apparently, Stover quickly flashed what appeared to be a badge, but did so quickly enough that it made the manager suspicious enough to ask for a closer look. Immediately after the manager requested to see the badge again, Stover reportedly became argumentative, claiming that he was an undercover DEA agent. He also threatened to report the manager and employees at the restaurant to Wendy's corporate office. The argument continued for some time until the employees called 911. When police arrived at the scene, it's alleged that Stover immediately changed his tune, denying that he ever claimed to be a police officer or a federal agent. When he was searched by the responding officers, they quickly discovered that the badge that Stover reportedly flashed at the Wendy's manager was a concealed weapon permit. Stover was arrested at the scene and was charged with falsely impersonating an officer. According to reports, he has since been released from jail on a $2,500 bond. Authorities in Pinellas County, Florida say that they dealt with a bizarre suspected DUI case this week when a 38-year-old woman allegedly broke out into dance several times during a field sobriety test in a misguided attempt to prove that she was not under the influence of alcohol. According to reports, the incident began just before 10.30 p.m. on April 27th when a 38-year-old woman named Amy Ann Harrington was allegedly involved in a minor crash near her home in Madera Beach. When police arrived at the scene, they learned that Harrington had rear-ended another driver while traveling in her vehicle near Gulf Boulevard and 140th Avenue. When officers spoke to Harrington, they say that they immediately noticed the smell of alcohol on her breath. As they began to speak with her more, it seemed like her speech was slurred and she was unsteady on her feet. Police attempted to get Harrington to take a breathalyzer test, but she refused. So instead, they began to administer a roadside sobriety test this is where things reportedly got interesting. Rather than simply following the instructions given to her, when Harrington was told to stand on one leg and perform walk and turn tests, she instead broke out into a number of what appeared to be ballet and Irish folk dance moves. Unfortunately for Harrington, not only was she apparently unable to pull off the moves she was going for, she was also unable to complete the basic instructions given to her by police and she was arrested and taken to the local county jail on suspicion of driving under the influence. She has since been charged with two misdemeanors and was released on a $650 bond. According to reports, this is not the first time Harrington has been in trouble for similar circumstances. In 2019, she was reportedly also arrested for DUI after a crash. She ended up pleading guilty to a reduced charge of reckless driving and was sentenced to 12 months probation and 50 hours of community service. Unfortunately, it's unclear if Harrington also tried to dance her way out of being arrested in that incident as well. Authorities in Jefferson County, Texas are asking for the public's assistance this week to uncover the whereabouts of a man in connection with a bizarre burglary case after he allegedly broke into someone's property under the cover of darkness and mowed their lawn. According to reports, the strange incident unfolded on the night of April 1st when a homeowner in the city of Port Arthur called local police to report that an unknown person was cutting grass at their residence. It's unclear if the homeowner was at the property at the time, but what we do know is that the suspect was caught on multiple surveillance cameras that were filming the back and front of the house. In the footage, a man can be seen grabbing a gas-powered lawnmower from somewhere near the back of the property before filling its tank up with gasoline. 
After that, the man proceeds to mow the backyard before continuing his illicit yard work on the grass at the front of the house. When police arrived at the scene to question the man, he took off running, pulling the lawnmower behind him for a short distance before ditching it in an alley and continuing his escape. After that, he managed to get away. Despite successfully evading police, authorities subsequently identified the suspect as a man named Marcus Renard Hubbard. According to reports, Hubbard is now wanted for burglary of a building, and police are now asking anyone with information concerning his whereabouts to reach out to Port Arthur Police. Unfortunately, no additional information is available about why Hubbard allegedly broke into the homeowner's property, or if he had any plans beyond simply mowing the person's lawn. In what can perhaps best be described as a case of cosmic justice, authorities in Edgefield County, South Carolina, announced that a 60-year-old man had suffered a fatal heart attack this week while attempting to bury the body of a woman he had murdered. According to reports, the case began on May 7th when police were called to a residence on Tanglewood Drive in the town of Trenton with a report of an unresponsive man lying in his yard. When officers arrived at the scene, they discovered the body of 60-year-old Joseph McKinnon. McKinnon was lying near a large hole in the garden and appeared to have collapsed while doing yard work. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Because it appeared that McKinnon had died of natural causes, authorities didn't immediately have cause to believe that there was anything more to the situation, and their priority became notifying the 60-year-old man's family. This included 65-year-old Patricia Ruth Dent, who, according to conflicting sources, was either McKinnon's wife or live-in girlfriend. However, police were unable to locate Patricia, and when they learned from her co-workers that she hadn't been reachable that day, attention turned back towards the Tanglewood Drive address. A search of the house showed signs that it had been freshly cleaned. However, traces of blood were also found. Eventually, investigators made their way out to the property's garden once again, this time performing a more thorough search of the area. When they looked inside the hole near where they had discovered McKinnon, they finally found Patricia's remains. She had been wrapped in black garbage bags and partially buried at the bottom. An autopsy reportedly filled in the remaining pieces of the puzzle. While McKinnon had died of natural causes, Patricia had been strangled. Based on this information, investigators concluded that McKinnon had murdered Patricia and had tried to cover up the crime by burying her in the garden, and at some point during this time, had suffered a massive heart attack. While the exact motive behind the brutal crime may never be known, given the bizarre circumstances, authorities say that they are satisfied with the evidence they have uncovered. According to Edgefield County Sheriff Jody Rowland, quote, basically, this case is over. Authorities in Olmstead County, Minnesota say that a 53-year-old woman is in custody this week after she tried to flee from police who attempted to pull her over, only to become trapped in 150 feet of freshly poured cement. According to reports, the bizarre situation began just after 4.30 p.m. on May 16th, when a police officer in the town of Rochester noticed a woman blow through a red light in her vehicle while yelling through a bullhorn. Apparently, the 53-year-old woman in question was already well-known to police by this point, as over the last few days, she had gotten into the annoying habit of driving down the street in her vehicle and screaming about religion from the same bullhorn. Needless to say, authorities had received plenty of complaints. However, when the officer attempted to initiate a traffic stop after witnessing the woman run the red light, she refused to stop, and instead, she took off. Because Rochester police apparently have a policy of not initiating vehicle chases unless a suspect is in immediate danger to the public, the 53-year-old was allowed to more or less go on her way for the time being. That being said, it didn't take long for her to find herself in trouble again, as witnesses observed her continuing to run red lights and drive erratically. At about 5.26 p.m., the woman's ridiculous behavior caught the attention of another Rochester police officer who also attempted to conduct a traffic stop. Once again, the 53-year-old woman accelerated and tried to escape, though this time she wouldn't make it quite as far. 
After driving toward Broadway Avenue, the woman crashed through a number of construction barricades, sending her sailing into about 150 feet of freshly poured concrete. While the woman continued to try and drive her way out of the quagmire, the concrete was victorious, and the 53-year-old remained trapped until she could be placed under arrest. According to the team in charge of pouring the concrete that the woman ruined, it's estimated that she did about thirty dollars to $40,000 worth of damages. She has now been charged with two counts of fleeing police in a motor vehicle, one count of first-degree damage of property, and one count of driving a motor vehicle without a license. Perhaps most importantly of all, it's said that following the 53-year-old's arrest, she was also taken for a psych evaluation. Authorities in Ashtabula County, Ohio, say they dealt with a different kind of DUI case this week when a deputy from the local sheriff's office had an encounter with an allegedly drunk Amish man who had passed out while driving his horse and buggy. According to reports, the incident began in the early morning hours of May 14th when the Ashtabula County Sheriff's Department received calls about a horse and buggy that was swerving all over local roads. At about 2.45 a.m., Deputy Mike Talbert caught up with the buggy and unsuccessfully tried to make a stop. To his complete surprise, when the buggy passed him, he could see a can of Bud Light beer inside as well as the passed out male driver. Talbert attempted to yell to wake the man up, but it was no use. After following the buggy for some time, Talbert eventually managed to block it with his car. However, the horse continued trying to walk causing the buggy to hit his cruiser. It was only then that the passed out driver, later identified as a man named Nathan Miller, woke up and started to get the horse back under control. When everything had finally calmed down, a breathalyzer test was administered to Miller, who blew over the legal limit. He was arrested and has now been charged with operating a vehicle while under the influence. In a later statement to reporters, a representative from the sheriff's office said that this week's traffic stop was quite unusual, but that they were happy that no one was injured. <laughs> Authorities in Clark County, Washington say that a suspected serial armed robber got more than he bargained for this week when he tried to hold up a gas station convenience store and was attacked by the store's cashier with a can of bug spray. According to reports, the incident took place recently in the city of Vancouver, when the suspect entered a local B&B Mart. After heading up to the cash register and placing a drink on the counter, he reached into his pocket as if to pull out his wallet, but instead pulled out a handgun. The man proceeded to point the weapon at the store clerk, Amber Maley, telling her to put all of the money in the register into a bag. However, rather than complying with the suspect's terrifying demand, Amber immediately sprung into action grabbing a large can of bug spray directly to her right. She then began to unload as much of the spray as she could in the man's direction while shouting at him to get out. Spooked by Amber's quick and aggressive attempt to fight back, the suspect immediately fled the scene of the bungled robbery empty-handed. Though the suspect managed to escape and his identity is currently unknown, authorities have released images of him taken from surveillance footage captured at the convenience store. Police now say that they believe he is a serial robber who may be responsible for more than 30 similar crimes in Clark County and the Portland metro area. His list of previous targets reportedly includes coffee shops, hotels, restaurants, and auto parts stores, and in each case, he is said to have been armed. Authorities are now asking for anyone with information about the suspect to come forward, in the hopes that he can be successfully identified and taken into custody. He is described as a man between 30 and 35 with brown hair and a brown beard, roughly 5 feet 8 inches to 5 feet 10 inches tall and weighing 160 pounds. Though police have warned members of the public from confronting the suspect directly like Amber did, according to her, the idea of giving him the money like he demanded never even crossed her mind. In a recent interview, she said that her instinct to protect herself was automatic and that in the moment, all that she knew for sure was that she wanted the armed criminal out of her space.
representatives from the Florida Department of Justice say that a 54-year-old suspected health care fraudster has been successfully taken into custody this week after he allegedly tried to flee the country on a modified jet ski. According to reports, the case began recently when investigators uncovered what they say was a multi-million dollar Medicare scam orchestrated by a 54-year-old Hialeah man named Ernesto Cruz Graveran. As the owner of a company called Zico Enterprises, Inc., Graveran claimed to provide durable medical equipment to Medicare beneficiaries. However, authorities say that this equipment was never provided by the company nor was it ever requested in the first place by eligible Medicare recipients. Instead, investigators allege that Graveran simply fabricated and submitted fraudulent claims to Medicare. These claims were estimated to be worth at least $4.2 million and were submitted over the course of just two months this year. However, when Graveran's alleged scheme was uncovered, he apparently had no intention of facing trial and attempted to flee when a warrant was put out for his arrest. After modifying a jet ski so that it could travel longer distances and grabbing food, water, and other supplies, Graveran took to the ocean, planning to travel the roughly 90 miles from Key West to the shores of Cuba. Unfortunately for Graveran, he soon encountered mechanical difficulties while out on the open water. He was found by members of the U.S. Coast Guard and U.S. Customs and Border Protection on his broken-down jet ski and placed under arrest. At the time, the 54-year-old was also said to be in the company of a suspected human smuggler. At the time of this recording, Graveran remains in police custody and has been ordered to be held without bail in Miami until his trial. Authorities in Virginia Beach, Virginia say that two men in their 20s are in custody this week after they allegedly masterminded a scheme in which they illegally siphoned thousands of dollars worth of fuel from a gas station and sold it at discounted prices. According to reports, the incident began sometime on June 14th when officers from the Virginia Beach Police Department received a call about suspicious activity at a Sitco gas station located on the 1400 block of North Great Neck Road. Though the gas station was supposed to be closed at the time, when police arrived at the property, they observed a number of people in vehicles at the location. It was clear that gas was being pumped and that vehicles were being filled up. When officers investigated further, they reportedly discovered that two men, later identified as 24-year-old Rashane Griffith and 21-year-old Devin Drumgool, had managed to use tools to illegally siphon fuel from the Sitco gas station. The men had allegedly been operating the scheme for several days, during which time they had found customers by advertising discounted gas on social media and had taken payment for the stolen fuel through an app on their phones. Both men were subsequently arrested and are each now facing charges of grand larceny, conspiracy, and possession of burglary tools, though police say more charges could be coming. While Griffith and Drumgool remain in police custody at the time of this recording, owing to the high price of gas, Virginia Beach police are now encouraging other stations in the area to review their surveillance footage and to keep an eye out for similar types of crimes. Authorities in Martin County, Florida, say that a man survived a harrowing two-day kidnapping this week after three men forced him to get behind the wheel of a vehicle during the ordeal, and he drove badly on purpose to attract the attention of police. According to reports, the incident began sometime at the beginning of last week, when the three suspects showed up at the victim's home in Port St. Lucie. While the victim has not been identified by name, reports state that he runs a dog breeding business and had recently posted about his financial success online. This had attracted the attention of the suspects, who decided to pay him a visit. After posing as interested dog buyers, authorities say that 22-year-old Tzdekiel Sellers, 25-year-old Benyavin Radcliffe, and 22-year-old Kashavia Bragdon went to the victim's home and proceeded to kidnap and assault him. They also demanded that the man hand over the cash he had talked about making from his dog breeding business. 
for the next two days. The victim was allegedly held captive by the three suspects and was taken to multiple locations where the robbery and assaults continued. That was until the criminals reportedly made a critical mistake and forced the victim to get behind the wheel of his own vehicle. While on the road, the suspects told the victim to drive to a location that took them through Martin County, where it just so happened officers from the local sheriff's department were patrolling as part of their traveling criminal response team. It was then that the victim got an idea. Knowing that he needed to get the attention of police, the victim began driving erratically, committing multiple traffic infractions, hoping that officers would notice. Sure enough, one officer did and proceeded to pull him over. Much to the victim's horror, however, after approaching the vehicle and briefly talking to him, the officer decided that he would graciously let him off with a warning. Too afraid to say anything in front of his captors, as the officer started to walk away, the man began to make hand motions, signaling that something was going on. Thankfully, the police officer noticed, told the victim to get out of the car, and he was able to explain the whole situation. The Martin County Sheriff's deputy called in backup, and all three of the suspects were subsequently arrested. Inside the vehicle, authorities found guns, knives, and a large amount of cash. According to reports, Sellers, Radcliffe, and Bragdon are all now facing a laundry list of charges in connection with the incident, including carrying a concealed firearm, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, kidnapping to commit or facilitate the commission of a felony, home invasion, and providing a false name. While it's often said that parents will do anything for their kids, we're guessing that most normal folks would stop short of fighting the police with construction equipment to prevent a lawful arrest. As officers with the Vermont State Police found out this week, however, this was not the case for one couple from Caledonia County. According to reports, the whole situation began on the evening of June 14th, when Vermont State Police were investigating a suspected aggravated assault and burglary case. At around 7 p.m. that day, officers were confident that they had located the suspect, a man whose name has not been released, at a property in the town of Hardwick. However, when they attempted to place the man under arrest, all hell broke loose. Not only did troopers have to contend with the suspect resisting arrest, but as they soon learned, his parents, Wayne and Amy Tallman, were also eager to get in on the action. Amy reportedly ran at the officers as they were in the middle of the scuffle with her son, while Wayne got behind the controls of an excavator and proceeded to recklessly maneuver its bucket. At multiple points, he was caught on police dash cam, lowering the excavator bucket towards the trooper's patrol vehicle, as well as the troopers themselves. Fortunately, the officers were eventually able to get the ridiculous situation under control, and all three family members were placed under arrest. While little information is currently available about the unidentified suspect who started the whole thing, According to reports, his mother Amy was issued a citation for impeding an officer, while his father Wayne was taken into custody on charges of aggravated assault on a protected official, resisting arrest, impeding, and reckless endangerment. Thankfully, it appears that neither of the state troopers involved in the incident were seriously hurt, though it's easy to see how things could have turned out much differently. Speaking about the bizarre circumstances after the fact, a commander with the Vermont State Police noted, quote, they don't have a scenario at the academy where we practice this one. Representatives from the NYPD say that a 24-year-old woman was recently rescued from a violent and terrifying hostage situation after she cleverly reached out for help through a Grubhub delivery order. According to reports, the situation began sometime either late on June 18th or early on June 19th, when the 24-year-old victim agreed to meet up with a man that she had met through a dating app. That man, later identified as 32-year-old Kimoy Royal, allegedly proceeded to kidnap her, assaulting her repeatedly at his home in the Bronx. The woman's terrifying ordeal apparently lasted for hours, until finally, Royal allowed the 24-year-old to order some food. Using the food delivery app Grubhub, the woman seized her opportunity, writing a plea for help in the additional information section of her order. That message was received by employees of the Chipper Truck, a restaurant in Yonkers. 
though the employees were initially unsure what to do about the message because it was hastily written and apparently a bit hard for them to understand. They decided that the mention of calling the police was too serious to ignore and decided to contact authorities. When police showed up, they were able to rescue the 24-year-old victim, placing Royal under arrest. According to reports, Royal is now facing numerous charges, including strangulation, menacing, assault, criminal possession of a weapon, and unlawful imprisonment. Authorities in Miami-Dade County, Florida say that a 34-year-old man is facing a slew of charges this week after he allegedly carjacked a man at a local fast food restaurant because he refused to buy him chicken nuggets. According to reports, the incident began sometime on June 23rd, when the victim, who has not been identified by name, pulled up to a Wendy's restaurant on Northwest 27th Avenue in the community of West Little River. As the man got out of his car, he was approached by 34-year-old John Earl Taylor, who reportedly asked him if he would buy him some chicken nuggets. The victim apologized, explaining that he only had enough money for his own meal, and proceeded to enter the fast food restaurant, likely thinking this was the end of the interaction. However, when the man walked out of the Wendy's, he was once again approached by Taylor, who at this point was reportedly no longer in an asking mood. After pulling out a handgun, the 34-year-old demanded the victim hand over his gold chain and car keys. When the victim complied, Taylor allegedly grabbed the items and sped off in the man's car. Unfortunately for Taylor, it didn't take long for police to catch up with him. The next day at around 10.15 a.m., a burglary detective spotted the stolen car in a parking space near Northwest 7th Avenue and 79th Street. While Taylor managed to hop into the vehicle and take off before backup could arrive, a full pursuit soon took place, ending when Taylor crashed near Northwest 10th Avenue and 119th Street. The 34-year-old was arrested and is now facing charges including armed robbery, fleeing and eluding police, and driving with a suspended license. It looks like it might be a while before he gets those chicken nuggets. Representatives from both the Georgia Bureau of Investigation and the town's county district attorney's office say that they are investigating a bizarre and quite frankly embarrassing incident this week after officers from two local police forces tried to stop a man for the same traffic violation and it turned into a heated confrontation. Though it's unclear how the actual incident began, based on body camera footage taken from one of the officers, we know that it took place at around 5.30 p.m. on June 24th, when the driver of a pickup truck was pulled over somewhere between the city of Hiawassee and outside its city limits into Towns County. However, what started as a routine traffic stop turned into a vitriolic screaming match when officers from both jurisdictions tried to question the motorist. Representing the city of Hiawassee was Sergeant Tracy James, who it appears initially began pursuing the driver. Representing Towns County was Sheriff Ken Henderson, who it appears may have been the one who pulled the driver over. We're not sure about this, as who did what first appears to be the heart of the argument over jurisdiction. What we do know is that the argument quickly turned into a heated one, with both officers embarrassingly threatening to arrest each other. In the body cam footage, James screams at Henderson about taking over his traffic stop, while Henderson berates and demeans James, calling him, quote, a fuckboy. James responds with colorful insults of his own. At one point, the officers even turn to the motorist who had been pulled over, asking him to weigh in on where he had committed his driving offense to try and settle the matter of jurisdiction. Eventually, it appears that James got back into his own patrol car and left the scene, though not before Henderson allegedly referred to Hiawassee police officers as, quote, enemies of his office. While it appears that the situation currently remains unresolved and no charges have been brought as a result, the local district attorney's office and the State Bureau of Investigation now say that they have taken an interest in the case. It's unclear what, if any, disciplinary actions might yet be taken.
Representatives from the NYPD say that a 25-year-old man is being held on numerous charges this week after he attempted to flee police after being pulled over. A chase which culminated in him making a terrifying and dramatic leap from some elevated subway tracks to a second-story rooftop. According to reports, the incident began as a routine traffic stop on the afternoon of July 6th, when police officers on patrol allegedly spotted 25-year-old Kendall Floyd driving around without wearing a seatbelt in Brooklyn's Williamsburg neighborhood. After pulling Floyd over at Humboldt and Debevoise streets at around 4.10 p.m., police went to approach the 25-year-old's vehicle, when without warning, he allegedly flung his car door open, striking one of the officers in the arm. Floyd then took off running. Though Floyd managed to evade police for a short time on foot, they were eventually able to catch up with him once again about three blocks away, near Flushing Avenue subway station at Graham and Broadway. However, Floyd was still not ready to surrender just quite yet, managing to quickly climb to the top of a stanchion pole supporting the nearby elevated subway tracks. In harrowing footage of the incident that was recorded and posted to social media, Floyd could be seen standing at the top of the pole and adjusting his footing, as if preparing for a jump. It soon became clear to terrified onlookers below that this is precisely what the 25-year-old was getting ready to do. More specifically, to make a desperate leap for freedom to the roof of a second-story commercial building. Though many people shouted up to Floyd, urging him not to jump and telling him that it wasn't worth it, it seems that he was determined to get away, as after some hesitation, he fully committed and made the leap. Amazingly, he managed to clear the gap and land where he intended. While we couldn't find any sources that estimated the distance of the jump, let's just say that from the looks of it, it's the kind of thing that would have been impressive to see even on a channel dedicated to parkour. Unfortunately for Floyd, though he managed to land his death-defying jump, this is where his luck seemingly ran out. Police were initially delayed from getting to him because of a tall fence that blocked access to the back lot of the building where he had jumped to, but at least one officer was able to scale that fence and Floyd was subsequently arrested. He reportedly suffered a leg injury from the jump, though it's unclear if he needed to be hospitalized before being taken into custody. As for why Floyd was so keen to get away from police, sources allege that it may have been because he had two open warrants against him for felony assault and burglary. However, this has not been confirmed. In any case, Floyd is now facing a whole host of new charges in connection with this week's incident including assault on a police officer, false personation, reckless endangerment, two counts of criminal trespass, and of course, a seatbelt violation. Authorities in Carson City, Nevada say that a 42-year-old man was recently arrested and is now facing charges after he and his family were discovered to be living inside a local children's museum where he and his wife worked, along with a large cache of weapons. According to reports, the situation unfolded beginning on the evening of June 30th, when police received a call about a two-year-old boy who was wandering around alone close to a busy road. When they arrived to investigate, they learned that the boy had walked out of the nearby Children's Museum of Northern Nevada. According to the building's website, the museum has been in operation for nearly three decades and was created to provide a play-based learning experience for young children and their families, and includes exhibits in the arts, sciences, humanities, and history. When officers spoke to the boy, they initially weren't able to learn much about what was going on. However, that changed when they talked to his older sister. She explained that her and her family members lived inside of the Children's Museum. Her mother was the museum's manager, and her father, 42-year-old Wilbert Calhoun, worked there as the janitor. It's alleged that as many as five children may have been living in the museum with Calhoun and his wife. It turned out that this living situation was news to the museum's board members, one of whom immediately came down to see what was going on after being contacted by police. Sure enough, when they searched the place, they found clothes, personal belongings, food, dishes, sleeping bags, blankets, and at least two mattresses, all of which reportedly belonged to Calhoun and his family. The discoveries didn't stop there, however. 
Inside of a storage area next to the museum's arts and crafts room, authorities found a number of weapons and accessories, including four handguns, a short-barreled rifle, knives, a baton, a taser, pepper spray, and ammunition. They also found three noise suppressors for the firearms that were illegal without federal government approval, as well as some marijuana and drug paraphernalia. While the discovery that Calhoun and his family had been secretly living in the Children's Museum was uncomfortable enough, needless to say, it was the weapons that bothered investigators and museum personnel most of all, especially since the place where they were found was completely unsecured and, quote, could easily be accessed by a wandering child. This posed not only a substantial risk to all of Calhoun's children, but also the many other daily visitors to the museum, again, most of whom are kids. Though museum officials have said that they are completely stunned to learn that Calhoun and his family had been living in the building, many locals in the area have since criticized this claim, asking how they could have possibly not known. It's unclear exactly how long the family is alleged to have lived in the museum, though reports we came across state that strange things had been witnessed there, such as lights being on at all hours of the night, for at least a year. At least one other person claimed that they had pulled their child out of the museum's summer day camp after discovering that kids were being left unattended, and also said that they noticed that the facilities were not being properly cleaned, and that the camp was routinely starting more than an hour late. According to reports, Calhoun has now been charged with child neglect and endangerment, possession of a short-barreled rifle, and possession of a suppressor. It's unclear if Calhoun's wife will also be facing charges, though at the current time, both of them have reportedly been fired from their jobs at the museum. Authorities in Pontotoc County, Oklahoma, say that they were treated to quite the tall tale this week when a 53-year-old murder suspect tried to claim that he had killed his fishing partner in self-defense because he was trying to feed him to Bigfoot. According to reports, the incident began on July 10th when the body of a man named Jimmy Knighton was found in the South Canadian River. After some investigation, police learned that Jimmy had last been seen the day before with his friend and fishing partner, 53-year-old Larry Doyle Sanders. The two had gone to do some noodling for catfish in the river. When Sanders was questioned about Jimmy's death, he reportedly admitted to killing his friend, but claimed that he had a good explanation. You see, Jimmy had been trying to summon Bigfoot, causing Sanders to fear for his life. According to the 53-year-old, things had been going fine at the river up until the two of them got into an altercation. It's unclear if the whole fight was about Bigfoot, or whether the mythical forest-dwelling ape-like creature was brought into the situation later. But what we do know is that at some point things turned violent. Sanders claims that Jimmy was trying to get away from him during the fight because he had called Bigfoot and was trying to get the creature to eat him. So he struck him with a stick and strangled him to death. Understandably, authorities did not buy Sanders' story, saying that they believe it's more likely that he was under the influence of something at the time that caused the Bigfoot-related paranoia. The 53-year-old has since been arrested and is now charged with first-degree murder. Authorities in Jackson County, West Virginia, say that they are investigating a case that is full of twists and turns this week after a woman who was in a coma for two years identified her brother as her attacker, only for him to die several days later. According to reports, the incident began back on the morning of June 10th, 2020, when 51-year-old Wanda Palmer was found in a horrific state in her trailer in Jackson County. She had been the victim of a brutal attack, believed to have been carried out with some sort of axe or machete, and though she was breathing shallowly at the time she was found, was basically on the verge of death. After being rushed to the hospital, Wanda slipped into a coma. She was transferred to a long-term care facility in New Martinsville, where experts weren't sure if she would ever wake up again. In the meantime, investigators hit more or less a dead end in her case though her brother, 55-year-old Daniel Palmer III, was seen by a witness standing on the porch of Wanda's home the night before she was found, there wasn't enough evidence linking him to the case. 
Then, on June 27th, more than two years after the brutal crime, a deputy in Jackson County received a call from the long-term care center where Wanda had been transferred. Amazingly, she had awoken from her coma. While Wanda was still seriously injured from the attack, she was able to speak with investigators, identifying her brother Daniel as the culprit. Daniel was arrested on July 15th for attempted murder and malicious wounding of his sister. Though this was certainly a turn in the case that no one had expected, things got even more surprising less than a week later, when police reported that Daniel had died while in custody. At the time of this recording, much of the circumstances surrounding the 55-year-old's death are a mystery, though several sources have stated that he was extremely uncooperative following his arrest, allegedly doing things like making it impossible for officers to take a new mugshot of him and refusing to sign the paperwork allowing for an attorney to represent him. There are also unconfirmed reports, however, that he may have been suffering from an undisclosed medical condition at the time. Currently, the situation is still developing. Just when we thought we'd hit peak Florida with our story about the Walmart scooter DUI from this week's main list, we came across a second story that we knew we had to share with you, which, if you can believe it, also happened in the exact same city. Authorities in Brevard County, Florida say that a 30-year-old man is facing several charges this week after he was allegedly responsible for causing a serious multi-vehicle crash that allegedly stemmed from him trying to play what police are calling, quote, a real-life game of bumper cars. According to reports, the situation unfolded at about 5.30 p.m. on July 28th in the city of Melbourne. Witnesses say it began when a red Ford sedan was seen intentionally hitting a black Mercury sedan near Aurora Road in Mosswood Drive. Things escalated significantly when the red sedan barreled through an intersection while trying to speed away, where it was hit by several other vehicles. This reportedly sent the car careening off the road, going airborne before it landed in a nearby parking lot. The impact was apparently so ferocious that it sent three people, including a juvenile, flying from the vehicle. A man who witnessed the crash said it was the worst collision he had ever seen in his life. All three people who were ejected from the red sedan needed to be taken to the hospital, including the juvenile who was airlifted there. Though the extent of their injuries have not been reported at this time, at least one source we came across stated that all three are now in stable condition. According to reports, the entire ridiculous incident was the result of a domestic dispute between the driver of the red sedan and the driver of the black sedan. The driver of the red sedan, later identified as 30-year-old Dominique Scott, is now facing several charges, including aggravated child abuse, driving while license permanently revoked, and grand theft of a vehicle. Authorities in Utah County, Utah, say that a 26-year-old man has been arrested this week after he allegedly ignited a 60-acre wildfire, one that started when he tried to burn a spider. According to reports, the incident began sometime between 4.30 and 5 p.m. on August 1st, when authorities received a call about a wildfire east of the city of Springville near the Bonville Shoreline Trailhead on the southwest side of Buckley Mountain. Though fire departments from Provo, Springville, Mapleton, and Utah County were quick to respond, drought and wind conditions soon caused the fire to begin to creep up the mountainside, and two helicopters had to be called in to assist. Thankfully, no homes or buildings were destroyed, and by the following day, emergency crews reported that the 60-acre blaze was 90% contained. As firefighters were working to extinguish the wildfire, they quickly found out that it had not originated from natural causes. They made this discovery after arriving at the scene to find a 26-year-old man named Corey Allen Martin, who said that he was responsible. When Martin was handed over to the police, he apparently offered a bizarre explanation for what had happened. According to reports, Martin claimed that he had been out walking his dog that afternoon when for some reason he decided to burn a spider he had seen with his lighter. In the process, he had accidentally ignited some of the surrounding brush, which spread very rapidly and quickly got out of hand due to the drought conditions in the area. Apparently, the 26-year-old offered no follow-up explanation for why he tried to burn the spider in the first place. Understandably, Martin was arrested after making this confession, at which time his belongings were searched. Police say that a jar of marijuana and other drug paraphernalia were found, though they do not believe he was under the influence of any substances at the time of his arrest. 
While Martin was initially booked for reckless burning and possession of marijuana, reports say that he has since been released from jail. At the current time, it appears that local authorities are still deciding whether to pursue charges against him. Authorities in Spokane County, Washington, say that a suspected burglar was on the receiving end of a double dose of instant karma this week when he was not only caught by police at the scene of a crime, but also sprayed by a skunk. According to reports, the incident began just after 3 a.m. on August 4th when officers from the Spokane County Sheriff's Office received a call about a possible burglary in process at a church in the city of Deer Park. The caller explained that a man wearing a mask over his face and carrying a flashlight had been seen on a surveillance live feed at the church walking around inside and looking at audio equipment. When officers arrived at the scene, it didn't take long for them to spot their suspect. The man, later identified as 28-year-old Grant Simonson, was observed walking around in the church before climbing out an open window. When police announced their presence, Simonson was reportedly cooperative and responded to commands to show his hands and get down on the ground. It turned out to be extremely bad timing, as at exactly that moment a skunk reportedly ran out from a corner, sprayed Simonson, and then took off. The 28-year-old was then placed under arrest. After being taken into custody, Simonson reportedly attempted to explain his presence in the church that morning. He said that he had been wide awake and bored, so he decided to go on a bike ride. When he discovered an open window at the church, he said he removed the screen from it to get inside because he was, quote, curious. Police did not buy this excuse, however, and Simonson was booked into Spokane County Jail for second-degree burglary. He was reportedly released later that day, and while reports don't mention why, we're guessing that the awful smell might have played a factor. Something must be going on with the fries at McDonald's lately, because for the second week in a row we've got a story about how a complaint about cold french fries ended up with someone being hauled off to jail. According to reports, this week's situation began sometime on the afternoon of August 12th, when authorities in Kennesaw, Georgia received two 911 calls from the same local McDonald's. When they arrived, officers were greeted by the first caller, 24-year-old Antoine Sims, who said that he and his fiancée had a problem with the staff there. According to him, they had ordered food, but were not given a receipt because of a problem with one of the restaurant's machines. They had waited around for a bit before noticing that their food was taking a while, at which point they inquired about it and were told that their order was sitting and waiting for them on a nearby counter. Sims told police that when he tried his fries, they were lukewarm instead of hot, at which point he asked if he could get a fresh batch. The employees said no, and Sims continued to complain, at which point the manager got involved. The manager offered the 24-year-old a refund, but he refused, apparently because the money would take several days to get to his bank account. At that point, the argument got even more heated, Sims was asked to leave, and both he and the manager called 911. When police spoke with the manager, however, they told a different story. They claimed that instead of trying to talk things out, Sims had hurled insults at the employees before throwing his food and drink at a staff member. When officers went back outside, they informed Sims that he was banned from the restaurant and that he needed to sign a notice of trespass. That's when Sims reportedly got visibly uncomfortable, refused to sign the order, and asked if he was under arrest. Police replied that yes, in fact he was. It turned out that almost three years earlier, Sims had been charged with the murder of a 21-year-old woman named Adelisa Muratovich. According to reports, in October of 2018, Muratovich was allegedly accompanying two people who were trying to buy drugs from Sims in Fulton County when the deal went bad and a gunfight broke out. Muratovich was struck and killed, after which Sims allegedly drove her body to a subdivision in the city of Lawrenceville and set a car on fire with her remains inside. Sims was charged with felony murder in March of 2019, though was released on a $275,000 bond earlier this year. He was due to appear back in court in July, but never showed up. When Sims was informed at the McDonald's this week that he was under arrest, he reportedly panicked and took off on foot. He was taken into custody a short time later, after allegedly being found trying to break into a third-floor apartment at a nearby residential building. Sims has now been charged for his outstanding warrant, for obstruction or hindering law enforcement, criminal trespass, and for possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute, 
because 31 grams of marijuana was found in his fiancée's vehicle at the McDonald's. Representatives from Oklahoma's Grady County Sheriff's Office say that a 36-year-old woman is in custody and facing charges this week after she was arrested while behaving erratically, managed to escape her handcuffs, and fired at police officers using one of their own weapons. According to reports, the situation began at around 11.45 a.m. on August 12th, when police received a mental health call to a residence near the town of Bridge Creek. They arrived to find a woman, later identified as 36-year-old Rachel Zion Clay, crawling around on the ground in the front yard of the property and barking like a dog. She was also yelling things that made no sense, saying things like, quote, Answer the phone. You let her die. And I'm not human. You killed her. She also talked about a non-existent child who she said needed a blood transfusion. Realizing that Clay was in an obvious state of distress, officers decided to take her into custody for her own safety. She reportedly resisted for a while, but eventually officers were able to get handcuffs on her and place her in the back of a patrol car. Unbeknownst to the officers, however, while they finished up things at the scene, Clay managed to somehow slip out of her handcuffs. She then reached through a sliding plexiglass partition to the front of the patrol car and grabbed one of the officers' rifles. Apparently, the partition had been left open to ensure that the 36-year-old could feel the vehicle's air conditioning. According to reports, Clay proceeded to fire at least 10 shots with the rifle, one of which grazed a deputy's neck and another of which hit a civilian. Because Clay was now barricaded in the patrol car, police were not immediately able to approach her. The situation led to a tense standoff that lasted between four and five hours during which time Clay wrote notes on pieces of paper with messages that were similarly nonsensical to the things that she had yelled when police first arrived at the scene. Finally, officers were able to reason with Clay and she exited the vehicle peacefully and was taken into custody. She was subsequently booked into the Grady County Jail on multiple counts of shooting with intent to kill. While little additional information has been released about the case at this time, reports allege that Clay was supposed to be on medication for an undisclosed mental health issue at the time of the incident, but had stopped taking it. Authorities say that her charges may still be changed. Though we've covered plenty of cases in the past where people have been arrested or even charged for abusing the 911 emergency system, representatives from California's San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office say that the culprit behind one such call will be getting off without so much as a warning this week. Don't worry though, there's a perfectly reasonable explanation as to why. According to reports, the incident began sometime on the evening of August 13th when dispatchers received a 911 call from a cell phone in the Paso Robles area. Upon answering, there was nothing but silence coming from the other end, and soon the call was disconnected. Despite repeated attempts by dispatchers to get back in contact with the caller, subsequent calls and text messages went unanswered. As is protocol in such cases, officers from the San Luis Obispo Sheriff's Office were sent to the area just to make sure that everything was okay. They arrived to find themselves at Zoo to You, a wildlife sanctuary and conservation organization. Staff, however, were adamant that nothing was going on and that none of them had made the mysterious 911 call. Eventually, someone put the pieces of the puzzle together and everything started to make sense. The culprit? A female capuchin monkey named Root. According to Zoo staff, the company has a cell phone that is usually kept on a golf cart so that employees can stay in touch while traveling around the 40-acre site. Being the naturally curious creature that she is, it appears that Root picked up the cell phone off the cart at some point and began pressing buttons. It's unclear if she dialed the exact combination for 911 on the number pad or whether she unintentionally activated a safety feature of a lot of modern smartphones which make emergency calls if buttons are pressed in rapid succession. Either way, police were relieved that there was no actual problem and joked about the whole thing in a subsequent Facebook post. They wrote that they didn't blame Root because, quote, after all, monkey see, monkey do.
Authorities in Bristol County, Massachusetts say that a Rhode Island woman got quite the surprise at the end of her nightly commute this week when she discovered that she had an unknown and unwanted passenger lying in the back of her vehicle. According to reports, it all started sometime late on the night of August 21st when a woman named Amanda Keene left her home in Providence to make her routine drive to work in the town of Easton, Massachusetts. Amanda reportedly works as an overnight delivery driver for a company called Honeydew Donuts, and her shifts begin late at night and run into the following morning. As far as Amanda was concerned, that night's trip was nothing out of the ordinary. It took her the usual 45 minutes to get to work, including a stop for gas along the way. However, once she actually arrived at her job, things took a strange turn. While finishing up a cigarette in her truck, Amanda heard what sounded like moaning noises. At first, she rolled down her windows, believing the sounds were coming from outside. But to her horror, when she listened again, she realized that they were actually coming from inside her SUV. When Amanda got out to investigate, she found a visibly intoxicated, half-naked man in the back of the vehicle trying to sleep. He had slipped into the space on the floor between the first and second row of seats and was partially obscured because the passenger seats had been folded down. After making the bizarre discovery, Amanda called the police. When officers arrived at the scene, they arrested the intoxicated, partially nude man who was later identified as 21-year-old Jose Osorio. When Osorio was finally sober enough to be questioned, police allegedly learned from him that he had snuck into Amanda's SUV all the way back at her home in Providence. It's believed that he made his way inside the vehicle while Amanda was bringing in groceries and left the SUV running on her driveway. Osorio has since been charged with breaking and entering into a vehicle. Perhaps the most ironic part of the story, however, is the reason why Amanda likely didn't hear Osorio sooner. According to her, she was listening to a true crime podcast during her drive and had her headphones in throughout the 45-minute commute. Though this next story is more crime-adjacent than a crime story, strictly speaking, we decided to include it on this week's list because we thought you all would get a kick out of it, and because sometimes it's nice to include a bit of comic relief in an otherwise heavy week. Now, we've likely all heard the expression, my dog ate my homework, at some point in our lives. But what about, the goat ate my paperwork? Well, that's apparently just what happened to one police officer from Alabama this week, when he left his car door open while out on patrol, only to have the vehicle invaded by some unwanted guests. According to reports, the incident took place sometime early on the morning of August 26th when Deputy Casey Thrower went out to serve civil documents somewhere in Madison County. When he returned to his car, he was surprised to find a pair of goats there. The first goat apparently wasn't much of an issue. It was standing on the roof of the vehicle and proceeded to walk down onto the hood after some time. However, the second goat was a different story. It had made itself quite at home in the driver's seat and was busy munching away on some of the deputy's paperwork. Exasperated by what was happening, Thrower tried to talk the goats out of leaving, sternly saying things like, get out of here, and you've got to be kidding me. It's unclear how long the situation lasted for, but apparently when Thrower finally left, he was a few papers short from all the munching that had gone on. Thankfully, the Madison County Sheriff's Office didn't blame Thrower for what had happened, and actually made light of the situation in a subsequent Facebook post. In it, they also referred to Thrower as a goat, though in this case, meaning greatest of all time. As for why Thrower's door was left open in the first place, he said that there were a couple of reasons. Part of it is because of how many trips like this he makes in a given day, but he also says that it's because in the past, He's found himself in a number of situations where he's had to quickly flee from dog attacks. It's unclear if the dogs also had the same enthusiasm for destroying his paperwork. Authorities in Tupelo, Mississippi say that a local airport worker has been arrested and is facing charges this week after he stole a small plane and threatened to crash it into a local Walmart. 
According to reports, the situation began shortly after 5 a.m. on September 3rd when the suspect, Corey Patterson, allegedly stole a Beechcraft King Air C-90 twin-engine airplane from the Tupelo airport. He then began to fly around the local area and started making threats once police were able to make contact with him. Authorities say that as they tried to negotiate with Patterson, he said that he was considering crashing into the nearby Walmart on West Main Street, causing the store and several surrounding businesses to be evacuated. After several hours of back and forth with Patterson, police were finally able to get him to agree to end the situation peacefully, though he reportedly did not have the skills to land the stolen plane. As a result, a private pilot had to be brought in to verbally walk him through the steps on how to touch down. Once receiving instructions, Patterson reportedly aborted the planned descent and took off towards Benton County. Fortunately, police were able to establish contact with Patterson at around 10.15 a.m., at which point he confirmed that he had landed in a field about 60 miles away. He was placed under arrest and has now been charged with grand larceny and making terroristic threats. While authorities have not confirmed a motive behind the case, several sources we came across stated that so far police believe that the theft was a crime of opportunity. Apparently, Patterson has worked for an aviation company at the Tupelo airport for the last 10 years, and most recently was in charge of refueling aircrafts. Still, the actual why behind the crime reportedly remains a mystery. At the time of this recording, Patterson is in custody in Benton County and is awaiting a transfer to Tupelo. Authorities in Fayetteville, Arkansas say that an executive at the well-known vegan food company Beyond Meat got a taste of the real thing this week when he allegedly attacked another man in a parking lot and bit his nose. According to reports, the strange and violent situation unfolded sometime after 10 p.m. on September 17th in a parking garage near Fayetteville's Razorback Stadium. It began when 53-year-old Doug Ramsey, described online as the chief operating officer of Beyond Meat, was in his vehicle attempting to leave the parking garage after watching a college football game. As Ramsey was in the traffic lane near Gate 15, another man driving a Subaru allegedly inched his way in front of his Ford Bronco. When he did, he reportedly caused a minor collision, making slight contact with the front passenger's side tire. According to witnesses, the situation sent Ramsey into a rage, who got out of his vehicle and proceeded to punch out the back windshield of the Subaru. When the driver got out of the vehicle, Ramsey allegedly pulled him in close and started to punch him. It was during this assault that he reportedly bit the man's nose, ripping some of the flesh off at the tip. Witnesses allege that they also heard Ramsey threaten to kill the Subaru driver. The situation was finally brought to an end when occupants of both of the vehicles got out and managed to pull the two men apart. When police were called to the scene, Ramsey was placed under arrest. He is now facing charges of third-degree battery and making terroristic threats. Following the incident, Beyond Meat released a statement saying that the executive had been suspended effective immediately. At the time of this recording, Ramsey has reportedly been released on bail. His next court appearance is scheduled for October 19th. Authorities in Pinellas County, Florida say that a 23-year-old man has pleaded guilty to a felony charge this week after he was involved in a bizarre and dangerous incident last year in which he led police on a high-speed chase to impress a woman. According to reports, the situation began on the night of August 28, 2021, when a man, later identified as then 22-year-old Taylor Beverly, was observed by police in Clearwater blowing through a red light at the intersection of Chestnut Street and South Myrtle Avenue. As he did this, Beverly apparently turned around and made eye contact with officers from his white 2017 Suzuki motorcycle before speeding off. Though police attempted to make a stop, Beverly refused to pull over, continuing to fly through red lights and weave through traffic at speeds of well over 100 miles per hour. Because the chase quickly became dangerous, officers called off their pursuit, but put out a notice for other law enforcement in the area to be on the lookout. 
Beverly was eventually caught just before 10 p.m. that same night. At the time of his arrest, Beverly offered a bizarre excuse for his behavior, stating that he had been trying to show off for the female passenger who was also on his motorcycle. He said that the two of them were on a first date. It turned out that police were not the only ones who did not see the humor in the situation, though. The woman herself stated that she had been screaming at Beverly to stop throughout the chase, but that he had refused to do so. Beverly ultimately pleaded guilty to a fleeing or eluding charge, and this week was sentenced to two months in jail. In addition to the jail time, the 23-year-old's license was suspended for a year, and he was ordered to pay about $700 in court fees and fines. Apparently, this is not the first time Beverly has been in trouble with the law. In addition to prior convictions for grand theft, cocaine possession, and passing a bad check, the 23-year-old was also cited for reckless driving and driving an unregistered vehicle following a 2019 motorcycle crash. Representatives from Texas's Kaufman County Fire Marshal's office say that they have made an arrest in a bizarre arson case after a man dragged a flaming trailer through the county earlier this summer, leaving behind a trail of destruction in his wake. According to reports, the incident began on July 31st, when police and firefighters received calls from multiple concerned citizens about a man pulling a burning trailer behind his vehicle on roads all over Kaufman County. The trailer was completely engulfed in flames, but the driver continued to go about his business as if nothing was wrong, seeming not to be bothered by the dangerous situation. Though police responded quickly to the calls, the man eventually unhitched the flaming trailer on a local bridge and fled the scene before he could be caught. Before he did, he managed to start several grass fires, including some which were near residences, causing at least nine homes to be evacuated. While thankfully none of these homes were destroyed, reports state that property was damaged and around seven acres were burned before emergency workers could extinguish all of the fires. Understandably, photos and videos taken of the driver's vehicle and burning trailer quickly circulated online, with the unknown culprit being dubbed Rocket Man. Unfortunately, no one had managed to get the man's license plate, and police asked members of the public who might have any additional information to come forward. Well, according to reports, the search for Rocket Man finally came to an end on September 16th, when he was arrested at a Walmart in Hood County, about 100 miles away from where the incident happened in July. Rocket Man has now been identified by police as a 43-year-old man named Jeffrey Daniel Furr from Canton, a city just east of Kaufman County. Furr was apparently already a fugitive at the time of the July incident, but is now facing additional charges for arson. Representatives from the NYPD say that they are investigating a case that is equally bizarre and unsettling this week after a pair of teenagers were attacked and robbed on the subway by a group of at least six women who were dressed in neon green bodysuits. According to reports, the incident began at around 2 a.m. on October 2nd when the two victims, both of whom were 19-year-old women, were on their way home. They had been out celebrating one of their birthdays the previous night and were waiting to catch the end train in Times Square when all of a sudden they heard a commotion. It was a group of at least six women who they described as, quote, loud and obnoxious, charging down the stairs and towards the subway platform. They were dressed in neon green bodysuits, some complete with a neon green ski mask over their faces, causing them to look like a sort of cursed mashup between an alien and Shrek. The 19-year-olds say that they made no attempt to engage with the group, even after a couple of them deliberately bumped them while walking past. When the subway arrived, the victims tried to avoid the group and get into a different subway car, but the other women poured in behind them from all available entrances. According to the victims, once the subway started moving, the neon jumpsuit-wearing women started to attack them. Because the assailants both outnumbered the teenagers and were quite a bit larger than them, they didn't really stand a chance. Footage of the disturbing incident was captured by several bystanders, 
many of whom were apparently men, who chose to film rather than try to intervene, while the two victims were pummeled and their cell phones, wallets, credit cards, and other items were stolen. The attackers eventually fled when the subway stopped at another station. The 19-year-olds were later admitted into a local hospital with injuries including bruising, bite marks, and a concussion. At the time of this recording, the neon green assailants are still on the loose, though police say that they believe they have identified a couple of the women's social media accounts. Expressing her outrage after the incident, one of the girl's mothers said, quote, Thankfully, my daughter is here. It could have been so much worse. These people belong in cages. Animals belong behind bars. Representatives from North Carolina's Burlington Police Department say that the suspect behind a violent attempted home invasion was able to be tracked down and arrested this week after he unintentionally left a piece of himself behind at the crime scene. According to reports, the whole thing started at around 7 a.m. on October 6th when Burlington police were called to a residence on Sellers Mill Road. There, they were met by the injured homeowner, who explained that he had just been the victim of a violent attack. The man said that he had left his house that morning to start his car, but as he was walking back inside, he was approached by an unknown man with a gun. The suspect tried to force his way into the residence, prompting a struggle in which the unknown man fired his gun. Luckily for the homeowner, the bullet had only grazed his chest, allowing him to shut the door on the suspect and call for help. It was only after the man fled the scene and police had arrived that the victim realized that he had quite literally shut the door on his attacker, or his finger to be exact. He had apparently done this with such force that the man's severed digit was found inside a glove that he had left behind at the crime scene. Forgive us the lame wordplay, but this turned out to be exactly the lucky break police needed, and the finger was subsequently used to track down the suspect. He has now been identified as 67-year-old Vernon Forrest Wilson. According to reports, Wilson was arrested on charges including first-degree burglary, assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill inflicting serious injury, and possession of a firearm by a felon. At the time of this recording, he remains in police custody in lieu of a $250,000 bond. Diners at a California ramen restaurant were allegedly treated to quite the terrifying and bizarre spectacle last week when a team of servers dressed in Power Rangers costumes were forced to become real-life superheroes while coming to the defense of an assault victim. According to reports, the incident took place sometime on the evening of October 14th at Noka, a Thai-owned ramen shop in Oakland's Jack London Square. The mood was playful that evening, as the restaurant was doing a weekly drink promotion for one of its cocktails. The drinks are served in special Power Rangers-themed mugs, and as part of the fun, servers dress up as the beloved 90s superheroes to add to the atmosphere. Little did these employees know, however, that they were about to be taking this role-playing experience to a whole other level. According to Ploy Pirapokan, who was having dinner at Noka when everything unfolded, it started when a woman came rushing into the restaurant looking frantic and saying that she wasn't safe. Before anyone could even take in what the woman was saying, a man came running in behind her. Terrified, the woman managed to yell that she didn't want to go home with this man as he proceeded to put her in a chokehold. Realizing that something needed to be done, the restaurant's manager, who was reportedly dressed as the Black Power Ranger, told the man to leave. He was accompanied by another employee dressed as the Yellow Ranger. Distracted, the attacker reportedly let the woman go and turned his attention to the two rangers. As he did, other staff members ushered the woman into the kitchen so that she could hide. Then, the man began to take swings at the two rangers who had stopped him. The Yellow Ranger reportedly blocked the hits. After allegedly resorting to calling the staff members a bunch of racial slurs, the man apparently tried to get to the restaurant's kitchen where the woman was hiding, but once again was stopped by the Yellow Ranger, who grabbed him by the collar and dragged him out of the restaurant. While this initially seemed to be the end of things, according to reports, despite repeated calls, police took quite some time to arrive. 
This allegedly gave the male suspect enough time to return to the scene once again, this time accompanied by another man. When he did, he reportedly continued his destructive behavior, picking up whatever he could and throwing it at the restaurant's windows. Once again, the employees sprung into action, this time with multiple Power Rangers getting involved in the fray. They allegedly piled onto the assailants, managing to push them through the doors, which they then locked to prevent them from getting back inside. After this, the suspect apparently seemed to lose interest in the restaurant, allegedly starting another fight nearby until police finally arrived and placed him under arrest. At the time of this recording, neither his name nor the name of the female victim had been released, and authorities allege that during the attack, the suspect was suffering some kind of a mental health crisis. As for the so-called Noka Power Rangers, not only are they now being commended for trying to keep everyone safe, but in another classy move, after the dust settled, the restaurant reportedly told all of the customers who were there at the time that their meals were free. Representatives from Massachusetts' Hampton County Sheriff's Office say that a 55-year-old woman is facing multiple charges this week after she allegedly weaponized honeybees against several of their officers during the middle of an eviction protest. According to reports, the incident began on the morning of October 12th when members of the Hampton County Sheriff's Office went to a property in Longmeadow to serve eviction papers to a man named Alton King Jr., who reportedly owes $1.3 million on his $1.5 million 22-room home. However, when police arrived at the scene, they were met by protesters who said that they were trying to prevent a wrongful eviction, claiming that King had obtained a bankruptcy stay that would temporarily stop the repossession of his home. While it's unclear if this was true, it seems that officers went ahead with their initial orders and continued to try and serve the eviction papers. It was during this time that things took a bizarre, and they argue, dangerous turn. As police tried to head towards the front door of the property, all of a sudden a woman, later identified as 55-year-old Rory Woods, pulled up in an SUV that was towing a flatbed trailer. On the trailer were numerous hives housing thousands of honeybees. After getting out of her vehicle, Woods reportedly proceeded to remove the lid from one of the hives, releasing hundreds of bees. A deputy jumped onto the trailer and tried to stop Woods, but was stung multiple times in the face and head and was forced to retreat. When he did, Woods managed to push over an entire tower of hives, releasing hundreds more now extremely agitated bees. At this point, even more officers were stung, causing several to run for cover. Woods was finally arrested after a struggle, though not before she allegedly donned a beekeeper suit to protect herself and tried to move her hives closer to the front door of the repossessed property. According to representatives from the sheriff's office, at least three of their officers who were stung were allergic to bees, with one needing to be hospitalized due to their injuries. When Woods was informed about this following her arrest, she allegedly replied, quote, Oh, you're allergic? Good. Woods has now been charged with assault and battery with a dangerous weapon and disorderly conduct. While the hospitalized officer was ultimately okay, in a later interview, Hampton County Sheriff Nicholas Kochi criticized Woods' actions, saying, quote, Luckily he was all right, or she could be facing manslaughter charges. I support people's right to protest peacefully, but when you cross the line and put my staff and the public in danger, I promise you will be arrested. A California family has reportedly been left stunned and extremely shaken this week after a neighbor allegedly showed up at their house and began to destroy their property with a pickaxe. According to reports, the strange and terrifying incident took place sometime on October 24th at a residence on the 1700 block of Asbury Drive in Pasadena. Homeowner Armin Chukadarian says that it began when a woman walked onto his property wielding a pickaxe. She proceeded to walk right up to the house and smash one of the windows with a tool before turning around to walk back down the driveway. Though this was already frightening enough, apparently this was only the beginning. As Armin's mother-in-law began to scream from inside to try to get his attention, the woman apparently took notice and doubled back. She then used the pickaxe to shatter at least six more panes of glass, 
before finally walking away, she hauntingly stated, quote, questions? Questions, anyone? I'll be back. Get out. We know all of this because the entire disturbing ordeal was captured on one of the home's exterior surveillance cameras. Perhaps most chilling of all, though, according to Armin, one of the first windows that the woman shattered was right next to the bassinet where his newborn daughter was sleeping. Barely holding back tears, he told the media in a subsequent interview that if it weren't for the quick actions of his mother-in-law, who removed the child from the bassinet at the first sign of trouble, the child likely wouldn't have survived due to all the glass that fell inside. A short time after the incident, police were able to track down the woman allegedly responsible. She has since been identified as 65-year-old Beverly Baker, a neighbor who lives just a few blocks away. Baker was reportedly arrested at her home on the 1600 block of Casa Grande Street after a 30-minute standoff with police. Multiple reports state that she was suffering some sort of mental health crisis at the time, though apparently this has not yet been confirmed. Baker is now facing charges of felony vandalism. Armin says that he and his family have no idea who Baker is and that they have been left traumatized by the whole ordeal. He estimates that about $20,000 worth of damage was done to his home during the incident. Representatives from the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York say that the nearly one-year hunt for a New York City fugitive recently came to an end after an investigator working the case got quite the bizarre stroke of luck. According to reports, the whole thing started last year when 31-year-old Kashawn Burton was accused of fraudulently obtaining $150,000 in forgivable federal loans intended to go to struggling small businesses at the height of the pandemic. He allegedly did this by stealing the identities of four people and using their information to apply for the loans. Once they were approved, he reportedly used an ATM to purchase money orders from a New York City post office to obtain the cash. One of the people who helped to investigate the crime was Federal Postal Inspector Jeff Andre, who eventually signed the criminal complaint against Burton. However, by the time police went to arrest the 31-year-old at his Brooklyn home in late November of last year, he had fled. For months, Burton's whereabouts were unknown, until by complete chance Jeff happened to take a vacation to Walt Disney World in Florida. Unbelievably, while in the Animal Kingdom section of the theme park on the afternoon of October 20th, he spotted Burton walking around. He recognized him thanks to a distinctive neck tattoo, an H written in cursive lettering. Jeff contacted the Orange County Sheriff's Office and explained the situation. Just over an hour later, Burton was arrested while waiting at a bus stop with two family members outside of the park. He was reportedly uncooperative and had to be taken to the ground in order to be finally handcuffed. Burton was reportedly using a fake name at the time and refused to admit who he was even after fingerprints proved that police had successfully arrested the right person. According to reports, Burton has now been extradited back to New York and will remain in custody without bail until his trial. This week, authorities in Pierce County, Wisconsin, released gruesome details in a horrifying elder abuse case, in which they claim a hospice nurse illegally amputated the foot of a dying patient without any kind of consent. While few details about the actual victim of the crime have been revealed, reports state that he was an elderly man who was admitted to the Spring Valley Health and Rehab Center in the village of Spring Valley sometime this past March. At the time of his admission, he apparently had severe frostbite to both of his feet. By May, the victim's condition had only grown worse. At least one of his two feet was necrotic and was being held on by dead skin and tendons. Staff at the facility believed it was only a matter of time before the man passed away. That's when one of the nurses there, 38-year-old Mary Kay Brown, allegedly decided to take advantage of the situation. According to reports, on May 27th, without any kind of doctor's orders, patient consent, or permission of any kind, Brown cut off the victim's right foot. Nurses who witnessed the situation later told police that the amputation was not a good or clean one, and that the patient was visibly and audibly in pain throughout. In fact, he reportedly told one nurse after it happened that he felt everything, and that it was agonizing. When confronted about what had happened, Brown apparently attempted to explain her actions by stating that she took it upon herself to do the amputation because she wanted to make the victim more comfortable. She also claimed that it's what she would have wanted if she were in the victim's place. However, police now allege that there was a far more disturbing explanation behind the whole thing. 
According to them, Brown's family has some kind of taxidermy business, and she wanted to preserve the foot and turn it into some sort of sick at-home display piece. She reportedly planned to have the foot next to a sign that said, quote, Wear your boots, kids. At the time of this recording, Brown has been fired from her job and is now facing charges of physical abuse of an elder person intentionally causing great bodily harm and mayhem. If convicted, each of the charges carries a maximum sentence of 40 years in prison. Sadly, none of the reports we came across gave any further information about what ultimately happened to the victim. Authorities in Jackson County, Oregon say that an elderly woman is facing multiple charges this week after police attempted to pull her over for a simple traffic stop, but she instead led them on a dramatic chase. According to reports, the incident began shortly before midnight on November 4th when officers from the Josephine County Sheriff's Department spotted a vehicle driving dangerously fast on the I-5 South near the town of Merlin. The driver, later identified as 75-year-old Elizabeth Catherine Essex, was reportedly clocked driving 112 miles per hour. When the officers attempted to pull Essex over, she reportedly ignored them and kept driving, prompting a chase. The pursuit was soon taken over by the Jackson County Sheriff's Department when Essex crossed over the county line. According to police, Essex was quite determined to get away and continued to drive even after spike strips were deployed seven times, puncturing all of her tires. She was finally forced to come to a stop after about 40 miles when officers conducted a successful pit maneuver on her vehicle somewhere near the city of Ashland. Essex was not injured and was taken into custody immediately afterwards. Following her arrest, police say that Essex bizarrely fought with them over how fast that she had been driving, saying that she had been going 104 miles an hour rather than 112. She also reportedly claimed that she had fled from police because, quote, she did not want to get arrested because she did not trust law enforcement. The 75-year-old is now facing multiple charges, including attempting to elude police in a vehicle and reckless driving. Authorities in Brevard County, Florida say that a 29-year-old man is facing charges this week after he tried to play a real-life game of Frogger on one of the state's busiest highways in an ill-fated attempt to escape police. According to reports, the incident took place sometime recently when a deputy from the Brevard County Sheriff's Office noticed a man driving at a reckless rate of speed on the I-95. The man, later identified as 29-year-old Zachary Siebert, was clock going at around 110 miles per hour. Not only that, he was driving with a suspended license. While Siebert did pull over for the deputy when signaled to, much to the officer's dismay, they soon discovered that it wasn't because the 29-year-old was planning to cooperate. Instead, immediately after stopping his vehicle, Siebert got out, yelled a quick apology, and then ran across the busy highway. After managing to miraculously avoid oncoming traffic on both sides of the interstate, he then disappeared into an adjacent forest. Unfortunately for Siebert, though his manners were top-notch and he was apparently pretty good at dodging cars, he wasn't so great when it came to dodging cops. After waiting just a short time, he apparently flagged down a driver and offered to pay him to take him back to where he had left his car. Police were, of course, still searching the area, and Siebert was allegedly discovered hiding in the back seat of this other driver's car while on his way back. Siebert is now facing several charges, including driving with a suspended license and resisting without violence. Authorities in Dade County, Georgia, say that they are searching for a 32-year-old fugitive this week after he was able to pull off quite the brazen vanishing act while in the middle of being taken into custody. According to reports, the incident took place on December 9th in an undisclosed part of the county. After having his hands cuffed behind his back, 32-year-old Tommy Morgan was reportedly put in the back of a Dade County patrol car by the arresting officer. 
The officer was apparently still standing outside of the vehicle when somehow Morgan managed to move his hands in front of him, force his way through the partition separating the front and back of the patrol car, and climb into the driver's seat. He then sped off in the car, hitting another police vehicle as he drove away. By the time officers managed to start pursuing Morgan in the remaining vehicles, he had allegedly disappeared out of sight. While police soon found their stolen patrol car abandoned in a ditch about a mile away, by that time, Morgan was nowhere to be found. A canine unit managed to track the 32-year-old for a few more miles, but eventually lost the scent. At the time of this recording, Dade County officials are requesting help from members of the public, asking that anyone with any information concerning Morgan's whereabouts come forward. Though reports don't mention what the 32-year-old was originally arrested for, police say that he is now wanted on charges of felony escape, motor vehicle theft, and interference with government property. Authorities in Boston, Massachusetts say that a 37-year-old alleged killer was caught under some pretty embarrassing circumstances this week after he tried to flee from police, but instead quite literally found himself hanging by a thread. According to reports, the situation began at around 8 p.m. on December 11th when Boston police went to an apartment building in the city's Roxbury neighborhood to conduct a welfare check. The family members of 43-year-old Jose Aponte had contacted them after not hearing from him for a couple of days. Even more concerning, someone had texted his boss over the weekend saying that he was sick. The message had come from Jose's cell phone, but the writing didn't read like his at all. After being let into Jose's apartment by maintenance workers at his building, police sadly found his body inside. Authorities now say that he showed signs of suffering significant physical trauma. However, an investigation had barely begun when the situation took another terrifying turn. Police realized that they weren't alone in the apartment. A man, later identified as 37-year-old Michael Perry, was in the back of the residence and had moved in an attempt to hide himself. When officers yelled out to ask if Perry had any weapons, he reportedly called back, quote, come and find out. Given the potential danger, a SWAT team was called in in order to deal with the situation. However, when they arrived, Perry tried to make one last desperate attempt at escape. Instead of giving himself up, the 37-year-old tried to jump from one of the apartment's 12th floor windows. Unfortunately for him, though, his clothes got caught on one of the window's handles, and he was reportedly left dangling upside down by his underwear. Police say that they were then forced to perform a precarious rescue in which some officers remained on the 12th floor and others went down to the floor below and opened another window. Perry was eventually freed and pulled in through one of these windows on the 11th floor. He was placed under arrest but was taken to the hospital to be treated for undisclosed injuries. Perry is now facing multiple charges including murder and assault with a dangerous weapon. Unbelievably, this is apparently not the first time that Perry has had bad luck with windows. According to reports, he was also arrested by a SWAT team in 2017 after he attacked a man at a Boston hotel and tried to jump out one of the windows there onto an awning below. In that case, he was also promptly arrested. Representatives from Arizona's Department of Public Safety are issuing a reminder to all drivers about the rules of the road this week after they say they pulled over a motorist who decided to try and get away with a little holiday hijinks. According to reports, the incident took place at around 8 a.m. on December 13th when an officer spotted something unusual while driving on the I-10 in the city of Avondale. There was something weird about the passenger in a red sedan that was being driven by a female motorist who was traveling in one of the highway's HOV lanes. What was wrong with the passenger exactly? Well, you might say he looked a little suspicious. It turned out that the so-called passenger wasn't a passenger at all. It was a life-size inflatable Grinch that the woman had apparently stuck in her front seat to make it look like she was carpooling. Understandably, 
the driver was pulled over. In a statement on Twitter, representatives from the state's Department of Public Safety said that while they appreciated the driver's festive flair, what she did was in fact still illegal. The woman was apparently issued a citation before being sent on her way. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a minute to thank our amazing supporters over on Patreon. As many of you are aware, our situation on YouTube always seems to be a bit uncertain but our patrons help to ensure that we can continue to make content like this long term without having to worry as much about what surprises might be thrown our way. Plus, patrons also get access to four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. If you'd like to help support the channel directly, head over to patreon.com slash crimezone to join. You can also find that link in the description below. As always, thank you so much for watching and take care.